Hello and welcome to Laudio's webcast series, Phoenix Leadership, Successful Leadership During Change. I'm CJ Floro, COO of Laudio, and leading the conversation with me today is Dr. Val Gokenbach. Val has been a nurse and CNO for more than 40 years. She has a true passion for leadership, and she's currently the Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at Baylor Scott & White All Saints Medical Center, Fort Worth, Texas. Thanks, Val, for taking some time out with us again today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, DJ. So as we begin to move beyond kind of our uh, period of change here with this COVID-19, and uh, we're looking at new normals emerging, and we know that there'll be a lot of change as a result of that. And if we look back in two, five, or 10 years from now, you know, we're looking at what are going to be the most critical attributes. And what are the changes that we're going to be sustaining through this time? And I think as we talk about Phoenix leadership, a lot of this has to do with adapting and pushing change as we discussed in the last sessions. But how do we measure that success? How do we know that we're making progress? And uh, how do we take this and, and build in some of this resiliency so this becomes operationalized? And that's the topic of today. So my, my question to you is this. We've created some new norms. We're moving through some changes with the teams. We've empowered these teams. Um, and we're getting some momentum here. But how do we start measuring the success? And, and how do we use those measures to motivate new norms here? Mm -hmm. Well, I think measuring is going to depend on the changes that you've made. So when you pick your data points, it's really understanding the data and then how do you apply the data. So if you look at um, First of all, if you're going to continue to move in the right direction, the, I think the one big communication mistake we make in healthcare organizations is that we think we're communicating and we're not. And, uh, you know, a situation last week where something came up and, and I said, well, let me, let me find out if we're really doing that because I thought we were going to do that. But I went to do the research on it and found out that we did it for a short period of time and then it fell off. And so the whole notion that people have to hear things at least seven times before it sets in and they understand it. And then the idea that we have to go out there and continually evaluate what's going on before we even start to measure the data so that we know that the process we put in place is still in place. You know, we have a lot of turnover in hospitals usually um, at the staff level. So you've got new people coming in, new people going out people that may not have been there when you made that particular change. So how do you keep going back and making sure that whatever you put in place becomes hardwired to the part, uh, to the point that it becomes just the way you do business. Mm -hmm. So, and you may not be able to articulate that. But when you look at data, if I'm going to evaluate data, so we had collapses was an issue. We put in a whole new process. We monitored the collapses were better than the national benchmark for nursing. Hall of falls, you know, falls with injury, virtually zero. You know, those are the things that we put significant change practices in. Pressure ulcers is another one. Significant change practices in um, nurse retention scores. What do we do to improve the quality of the workplace to um, make sure that those retention scores go up? So what you're going to measure is basically going to follow what you were um, trying to change in the first place. Um, the things that we monitor with the COVID right now is we monitor our numbers. We monitor patients going to surgery, um, positive tests, negative tests, those kinds of things. Um, but that's following the processes we put in place specifically for all the work we're doing around, around COVID. But I think what's really important too is this notion of resilience because you, your organization needs to be resilient, whatever the change is, and it needs to be resilient in order for you to continue moving forward with that change. And so really thinking about this notion of resilience is important. So let's unpack that a little bit in regards to where we started in the first session. And what we were talking about was assessing some of the things that are happening within your department or unit and realizing that some of them we're going to have to break down, start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I Obviously, we're only doing these things to affect some of the outcomes that you've just discussed, right? Whether it's safety and quality and so forth. So we can look at those outcomes to see, hey, are we impacting or not? And if we're not, we have to actually be measuring some of these 
new processes or systems as well, or training, mm -hmm. whatever it may mm -hmm. be. And so if we back up and say, okay, we're looking at some change here uh, and change management, um, what are some of the ways that you are effectively looking at in frequency, whether it's weekly or monthly in some of your staff meetings, mm -hmm. that whether the steps before the outcomes of the change management is happening? And tell us some of the pitfalls mm -hmm. that you've had when you're looking at that to, to create that impact. Yeah, I think one of the pitfalls is that when you look at resilience, the number one step to being resilient is an unwavering acceptance of reality. And a lot of times we put something in place and we really want it to work. It's, you know, this has got to work. This is going to fix us. It's going to be everything. And then we find that it didn't work. So I like to use what I call fresh look approach. So let's forget it. Let's throw everything else out. When we looked at falls, way back when, when I started looking at falls in my, 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 even my last job. It's let's throw everything out on falls. Let's look at this, break it down into different sections. We had a physiological section, we had docs in there. We had a um, um, educational session. We had structural session where we came in and we looked at the room. We looked at medications. We looked at IV fluids. We started turning IV fluids off at night because Older people, if they're getting a lot of IV fluids, they need to go to the bathroom more, and most people fall in the bathroom. So really taking a look at this, at reality, what is reality that you're trying to deal with? And the reality is if it isn't working, you need to change it. And that's what I see. I know we talked about ego in the past. Well, a lot of times leaders will go, well, no, but I, that was going to work. But they keep pushing, pushing, pushing because their ego won't let it go. So very, very important to do that. Um, I really believe in a lot of data. I believe in starting data the minute you start. Well, you should have your free data already going. But then um, if you look at special cause variations, so I'm looking at it from a statistical perspective, I find what we do is we throw a lot of things up against the wall. Okay, I want to improve patient satisfaction, so I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. And I throw everything up against the wall, and I hope something sticks. But now we've done 10 things. But what was the one thing that worked? Right. We don't know. So it's almost better if you do things one at a time and you look for that statistical variation that points exactly to what you're doing that made that difference. And then you focus on that rather than wasting your time on all kinds of other things. Great, great point. And I think something that is... Uh, Prevalent, I think, not just in healthcare, but in many uh, industries with leaders, mm -hmm. you know, with a shotgun approach, right? Uh, yep. But having the learnings from it and a lot of inefficiencies in that place. Um, my question, though, is, is with regards to these measures and the leaders, you know, I think it's key to your point for them to have this buy-in, right, this ownership, but also seeing the mm -hmm. impact of some of these um, new processes, new communications, new procedures. Okay. Have you found that there's a, 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 a certain frequency that's important to share the feedback of this data to them? And when is too long and when is too short? You know, daily, weekly, monthly? Any thoughts and ideas around what's worked for you and some of the teams that you've been working with? Yeah, I think it's, it, my big thing is that everybody needs to know what the data is. So we need to give it to them because how can you be engaged with something you're trying to improve if you don't know that it's improving? And you can't celebrate something you don't know that you can celebrate. But I find that there's different, usually if we look at things that we do on a daily basis, we, we do a lot with huddles. So on a daily basis, we look at our falls every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, did we have a fall last night? Where was the fall? What happened with the fall? Um, on the units, they will be looking at their falls every day. They'll be looking at their cauti, their uh, line um, numbers and things every single day. Uh, a lot of the things that we look at, like Prescani satisfaction, that's going to be on a monthly basis because we get the data from Prescani on a monthly basis. Um, things like our data that comes from um, HR. So if we talk about 90-day turnovers, um, our retention scores, those are going to be on a monthly basis because we get those on a monthly basis. And then you're going to have your long-term data. So if I do a, a nurse satisfaction 
um, analysis, that's usually done twice a year. So you're going to see that data every six months. But that doesn't mean we're not going to be working on what we can do to improve in the six months before we do that uh, survey again. So I think it really depends on, you know, my thing is feed everybody the data, give them the data, make sure that you empower them. They need to know so and, and get it to them as often as you can. Everybody should have it on their huddle boards, um, do it in your staff meetings, monthly your staff meetings, um, you know, and celebrate. Make sure that you celebrate the successes. You know, we haven't had a fall in three months on this unit. Celebrate those successes. And I think that uh, brings me to my to my next question. Uh, we've heard time and time again. I think we can all agree. There's a lot of great data in healthcare. There's a great dashboards and reports, and you know, leadership at all levels are provided these. Um, but we've all we've also heard with regards to uh, some of these things. I don't think I can impact this. Like I, I don't believe I can. And I think this gets back a little bit to you know, what you were mentioning earlier, that if you are isolating some of the new processes and systems in place, so you can actually see the correlation between your actions and change, mm -hmm. you start to get that buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you could be looking at dashboards and reports all day long and feel powerless that mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there are so many other outside influencers around me. How do you deal with, with that uh, in, in particular? Because I think we see that quite a bit, that it is a complex world, that me by myself as a leader can't uh, impact the satisfaction of, of the staff person. Someone else at a hospital down the street is offering more money. Uh, we have this to deal with with the union, and so we're unique in this way. No one else, I can't change that. So. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that type of attitude during these changes uh, and give them back the power, so to speak, and the belief that they can change and impact? Themselves? Yeah, and yeah, I think the, the best way to do that, if you're including your staff, like you mentioned, staff satisfaction um, as one of, the, uh, one of the things we talked about. But staff satisfaction is not only the job of a leader. You know, it's the job of the culture on the unit. So if we have a, a, a culture where, and I hate this term, but I've heard it over and over and over, that nurses eat their young a lot, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we want people to go through what we went through when we were young nurses and, you know, those kinds of things. And I absolutely hate that. And that's been, you know, lateral violence is one of the things that I just don't tolerate at all. But um, going back to the staff and saying, okay, on this particular unit, you've got a lot of turnover. What is the reason for it? And really look at what can you as a staff person do to get people to feel part of a community here so that new people will want to stay here? Because connecting the dots for them, because if that new person stays here, you have less turnover. You're not going to work as hard. You're not going to have to take more patients because the staff is going to be stable for you. So I think a lot of it is all about connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got some award program for your quality data. So, okay, so if your falls are good, your caudies and clapsies are where they need to be, you know, some hospitals give a bonus for that. So mm -hmm. connecting the dots is that, yes, you do. You are the people that are affecting this. When you look at patient satisfaction, people on the floor, the nurses are the ones Actually, what they say that, you know, the nursing has the biggest impact in those patient satisfaction scores because we spend the most time with the patient. So um, just connecting those dots, and I don't know that a lot of leaders spend the time connecting the dots. I remember growing up, well, I'd say my mom would tell me to do something, and I'd say, why should I do it? And she'd say, well, because I'm the mother and I told you so. Yeah. Well, the worst thing for us to do is say something like that to the staff because that's not connecting the dots for them. And we just have to be intentional about that and let them know that they do contribute in a positive way and show them what they need to do to continue co uh, contributing in that way. Well, you know, I'm glad you said that in terms of uh, the impact that these frontline managers have because they truly are the key lever to hit every mm -hmm. metric that matters most to a health system. And they are in the power position to do so. 
and mm -hmm. many of the things that you've brought up in the last three sessions here in order to optimize a leadership's impact and effectiveness with their teams and thereby obviously affecting their team's impact are crucial towards these times of change. And I think it gets back to the few things just to reiterate it is understanding who you are as a leader, yourself, assess where you are, check your ego at the door as a leader, and then decide how I can leverage my position as a leader to properly communicate to my teams um, what's in their best interest. How does this relate to make their life easier? Why is this important to them? Right, and give them ownership and empower them um, is what I'm hearing from you. And then as a result, provide them with the data and the frequency and the coaching on, uh, on a manner that allows them to understand what's working, what's not working, how to pivot, when to pivot, and isolate change in a manner that is um, uh, easy to see what, uh, what working. So don't put too many things changing at, at one time. And then lastly, I think it was resiliency that you said, right? Is to stay um, um, true to the mission, uh, aligned with the teams, and, uh, and with that will come the outcome. So this has been great. I can't thank you enough, uh, Val, for, for your insights. We definitely would love to continue this conversation and uh, you have much to share with many uh, that will help them immensely in their leadership roles. Managers are the toughest job in the organization. I always tell everybody that me as the CNO, I got the easiest job because I can celebrate them. Managers, I am the toughest job. They truly are. It's the most difficult job in a system. I think we all agree. And the more we can support them and guide them, uh, it will uh, immensely impact systems. And I think that's uh, the key place right now. So, well, thank you so much, Val. We appreciate your time. And, uh, we look forward to many more sessions with you in the future. Okay, thank you. Take care.